third way, I think, in which we can uh, give answers to this question, that is, if we learn from the lessons of the past, and there are many lessons we have to learn from the failed experiences of the past uh, two centuries, uh, if we learn from these lessons, and at the same time, uh, we try to explain uh, both the history of what happened in the last uh, particularly 200 years and try to see the trends within society, not as a kind of historical laws or social laws or natural laws or whatever, but we try to explain what's going on on the basis of an axiomatic choice. That is, we have to make anyway an axiomatic choice uh, everybody does an axiomatic choice in his life or her life. And I think the main choice one has to make is between autonomy and heteronomy. The autonomy tradition is the tradition which uh, can explain all the attempts that have been made in history for people to become self-governed or self-managed, if you like to become free in the sense that people themselves set their own laws rather than some high hierarchies at the top. The heteronomy tradition is the tradition which unfortunately was dominant in history in the sense that uh, this was the tradition that determined most of uh, human history and the various forms of heteronomous societies are well known. We started with slave societies and and we move to feudal societies, then we move from monarchies to uh, parliamentary democracies or representative democracies, which are also heteronomous societies, in the sense that there are political elites, again, that take decisions, although they try to give the impression that it is we, the people, who take the decisions. Uh, and then military dictatorships, various sorts, and so on. So <clears throat> all these forms of social organization are, in fact, heteronomous forms of social organization, in the sense that it is not the people themselves that take the important decisions affecting their own lives, the political decisions, the economic decisions, the social decisions, and so on. But at the same time, we, everybody, the casual observer of history, will see that there are also continuous and very frequent outbursts of what we call the autonomy tradition. Starting from the classical democracy in the 5th century BC, when people tried to organize themselves in a democratic way, despite the shortcomings and so on of classical democracy, but still, <coughs> people at that time tried to organize a form of social organization of which the people themselves would take directly, in general assemblies and so on, directly the decisions affecting their own lives. And this tradition continued later on in the medieval times with uh, the free cities. And then uh, after uh, the Renaissance and so on, we had a continuous movement in this direction. In every major revolutionary movement or uh, movement of insurrection, you will see the same trends being repeated again and again, starting with the French Revolution and the sections and the assemblies of the people taking decisions directly, uh, then continuing with the, French, the Paris Commune, then with the Soviets before they were uh, monopolized by the party. Uh, and of course, the major outburst of uh, the autonomy tradition in the Spanish uh, uh, Revolution. And it continued even after the Second World War with the Hungarian uh, Workers' Councils and then with the uh, May 68 <coughs> in uh, Western Europe and the States, until finally even up to uh, 2000 with the Argentinian insurrection. In all these uh, uh, cases, you will see that people are trying to organize in general assemblies, try to take decisions uh, directly, uh, workers organizing, uh, workers' councils, farmers organizing, collect uh, collectives, and so on. So it's obvious that the whole of history could be easily explained in terms of the conflict between these two major traditions, the autonomy and heteronomy tradition. 
And that's why I said at the beginning that we had to make an axiomatic choice. That is, you cannot prove that the autonomy tradition is uh, somehow scientifically the correct one. You have to choose and say that I want to be free. Freedom means autonomy, therefore I am in favor of the autonomy tradition. Once you make this axiomatic choice, then a whole series of principles follow of how you can explain the past, how you can see the future, and how we can see the movement from the past, from the present to the future. And that's it, what I call the political project. And the inclusive democracy project is exactly this. It is on the basis of the axiomatic choice of autonomy, attempts to give answers to all these questions and uh, suggest ways in which uh, the society of the future could be organized, not in the sense of a kind of model that people have to follow and so on. That is, this is something that the assemblies of the future would decide. That is, uh, it's social praxis, if you like, that is going to determine the forms of social organization of the future. The only thing we can do now is simply to try to imagine how such a society based on the autonomy principles uh, could be. And then, of course, it's for the future assemblies to decide exactly what they're going to do. Uh, so uh, I'll try to summarize uh, briefly how uh, we can give answers to these questions in terms of the autonomy principle. Um, First of all, as regards the first question of how we can explain the past and the present, um, it can be shown that all aspects of the multidimensional crisis I mentioned, that is the economic crisis, the social crisis, the ecological crisis, and also the political crisis, all these types of crises can be explained in terms of the dynamics of the present institutions, and which are the main institutions. First, it's the capitalist market economy, and second is the system of representative democracy. Now, each of these major institutions has its own dynamic, and the dynamics of each of these institutions lead to higher and higher concentration of power. And this can be shown, and I have tried to do it and others, but uh, this can be shown easily. That is, the capitalist market system, once you introduce, once you adopt a capitalist market system, then by its own logic and dynamic, it would lead to further and further expansion, further and further growth. It would create a growth economy. The market economy would become a growth economy in the sense of an economy which is motivated by economic growth. And uh, as this concentration continues, the system would come into periodic crisis, uh, and crisis like the present one is just one case. I'm not saying that the system would fall just because of a crisis, an economic crisis. I'm saying that it is built in within the system, built in within the logic of the system to create this sort of crisis, and these crises could be explained in terms of the concentration of power. Now, this is, of course, the objective trend, if you like to say, the objective trend that the system itself has. But I'm not saying that history is determined only by objective trends. In fact, to explain history, you have to take, to take into account not only the objective trends of the system, but also the counter trends. In terms of what I said before, uh, the elites, the ruling elites and the privileged social groups, of course, support the uh, objective trends. The trend for concentration of power and so on is promoted by the ruling elites, the ruling economic elites. The counter trends is the social struggle, that is the working class struggle in the past or today, <coughs> other forms of struggle that have been added to the working class struggle. All these represent the counter trends to the trends of the system. And actually you can explain past history on the basis of this conflict. For example, how you can explain the fact that uh, the capitalist market economy system was abolished in a country, the Soviet Union and then to other countries. How you could explain that social democracy were trying to reverse 
the trends, the objective trends I mentioned for more and more concentration of power. You can explain it only in the sense of this conflict and the fact that at some historical moments, people from below managed uh, somehow to reverse or postpone at least the tendencies, the prevailing trends that the system's dynamics creates. Now, if therefore you see the present growth economy as the byproduct of the uh, capitalist market economy, then you can explain also next the ecological crisis, because the ecological crisis is again uh, created by the concentration of economic power. In fact, the major ecological problem today, the uh, greenhouse effect, can easily be explained in terms of the growth economy and the consumer society that uh, follows the growth economy. Uh, also, the growth economy can explain the social crisis, because a growth economy means a growth society, in the sense that people are not anymore citizens, they are basically consumers. And when people are consumers and they are motivated by individualistic uh, motives and so on, then the present crime explosion, uh, the abuse of drugs and so on, could be explained. And then the same happened with the crisis in politics. Even there, it's the dynamics of the system that was established uh, about the same time as the capitalist market economy was uh, established. It's the dynamics of the parliamentary system or representative democracy, which itself is leading to more and more concentration of power. That is, initially it was parliamentarians or representatives who held the power, the political power, then this was taken over by the government, uh, government parties which were controlling the parliament, then it was uh, taken over by uh, the leader of the party, uh, which usually uh, used to be a massive party, and today we have the case where all political power is concentrated at the hands of uh, some cliques around the president or the prime minister, cliques of technocrats and uh, party bureaucrats uh, who effectively take all decisions. And then it's the parliament, etc., who simply uh, rubber stamp their decisions. So again, it's a matter of concentration of power.